Um, when I saw this conference, I knew I wanted to give a talk, and then I saw, oh, it's 10 minutes talks, and I'm used to giving uh, one hour talks or something in this uh, area on um, topics I'm interested in, and I wondered what can I possibly stuff in 10 minutes and still bring value. So um, I thought, well, uh, earlier in my software development career, there were a number of things I wasn't aware of that I really would have benefited from, from knowing already. And that's something I can do in 10 minutes. I can give you a number of pointers to topics that I think are of interest and that if you're not familiar with already, uh, you should check out. So I will not be underbuilding these topics. Many of them, like I said, you can talk about them for an hour easily. Uh, so just mentioning them um, in the hope that perhaps you're not aware of them already and that you can check them out later or perhaps if you already are familiar with these topics, that is just a helpful reminder. And since these are just pointers, this is pretty understandable to basically uh, people on any level. So if you're new to programming, this should not be an issue. So um, first, some motivation. Uh, the things I want, uh, I'm going to talk about here are about being able to go fast with programming. Uh, that's the end goal. We want to deliver value to our customer for our project, um, be a, uh, have as high external quality as possible and deliver as quickly as possible. And there is this common misconception that you can trade quality um, for speed and money. In the real world, often if you, yeah, for instance, if you want a better car, uh, you're going to pay for it more, right? Or if you want to have something done faster, you're going to pay for it more. So there is this notion that you can uh, just ditch quality and then have uh, a cheaper project or something that's done quicker. But uh, this doesn't work in the software world. If you've been developing for some time, you probably know you can waste so much time in your debugger. Um, I'm happy that I actually haven't used a real debugger in the last two years uh, because I started doing some uh, things I didn't do before. Um, this is uh, common knowledge that uh, we spend a lot more time in reading our code than in writing it, so it's very important that you optimize for humans. And uh, this is all kind of in line with the software craftsmanship topic, which I'm very enthusiastic about and which I recommend you check out if these things resonate with you. So um, first of all, naming is uh, kind of the cornerstone of what we're doing. If you're not naming your things clearly, then it's going to be very hard to understand what's actually going on. So it's important that you reveal the intent of what you want to do with the code. Uh, be it a variable or a class or a function or whatever, uh, we can easily waste a lot of time in, if we get some code that's polluted with a lot of details and then try to figure out what the original programmer wanted to do, this can be very hard. Uh, even if they implemented it correctly, which you don't know, um, it can take a lot of time to figure this out and this is a source of a lot of bugs in projects and also a lot of time. Uh, this is just a simple tip. Don't uh, abbreviate. Uh, in almost all cases, it's better to just write it out. And especially in the JavaScript world and so on, uh, if you're concerned about the size of your source, then, well, if you do this, perhaps your team would have time to write a, uh, or set up a minifier or a proper tool. Uh, avoid this information. This basically means use the terms for what they are intended to. If you have a list, don't call it a map, uh, things like this. Also use one word per concept, don't call something foo at one place and then bar at another place uh, because yeah, this often happens in teams where somebody likes this one name and somebody else uses uh, the other one and then to a new person it can be completely non-obvious that these are about the same concept. So uh, you want uh, to use a common language there. Also, don't try to be clever, clever or cute. Um, often you can use this, this other word, which kind of means the same thing in a smart way, but uh, while this might be obvious to you, this might not be the same for other people. 
Uh, one of our biggest enemies in uh, having maintainable code is uh, complexity, so you want to reduce this as much as possible. Um, if you want to get some idea of what the complexity of your code is by using some metrics, these are things you can look at. There are a lot of automated tools which can kind of point you to the most complex uh, parts of your code base with the caveat that they uh, have some tendency for false positives. Uh, some tips there are minimization of scope. Uh, don't put variables um, in fields. If you don't need them in fields, put them as local variables and also just try to avoid state in general and uh, especially exposing states uh, outside. Yeah, if you have some state in a class, don't expose it outside so you get weird situations where you uh, create a service, use it once, and then the next time you use it for something else, it behaves differently. That's really uh, a bad sign. Um, well, not, not a lot of highlighting left there. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, when I wrote the last slide, I actually didn't quite know how to explain uh, one small part here is this, uh, okay, let's show this. So this, uh, these are the same methods written in a different way. So we basically have two functional areas here. We have this part, which could be extracted as such, and then this part, which could be extracted as such. And here we have this message text variable, which remains in scope for the whole duration, and is also in scope here, which is something I think, if you see this, this is also a sign that, um, yeah, you're not using the minimum scope, and in this example, this is not like a big issue. I mean, this code also has other issues, but um, often if you have bigger methods and you have lots of variables in scope, then it gets really messy. Basically, uh, if you have something like 10 variables in scope of a method uh, or a function, that's a really bad sign. The same goes for having 10 fields or so in a class, that's, that's just too many. So talking about functions, uh, they should be small. They basically should do just a single thing, and in a lot of cases, this means just a few lines uh, of executable code. There are exceptions to this, and you should not try to minimize lines by putting everything on one line. That's not good, obviously. Um, one level of abstraction, uh, try, if you have some business logic, then uh, don't put details of um, how you format strings or whatnot in there. These are things you want to keep separate, and that greatly helps the readability of your code. And this results in little nesting. Basically, whenever you uh, have a body of an if block that has more than just a few lines of code, you can extract it and name what this part of uh, the body does. Uh, the same goes for the predicates of uh, if blocks and, and loops and so on. So try to just keep one single functional area in your functions. Uh, basically, if you have multiple functional areas and you have these variables throughout that uh, maybe get modified, then uh, what you're looking at is actually a class. That's, that's what classes are for, so try to make a class then. Uh, try to minimize parameters. They can make functions hard to understand if you have multiple of them, how they interact with each other. Um, especially in languages such as PHP where there is no way of naming uh, parameter from the outside. So you just have a function call and you're passing through five. What does that mean? You can't tell without looking at the actual implementation in a lot of cases. And uh, then there is this thing called command query separation, which basically says you should try to, uh, well, a method should either do something or it should answer a question, so return a value. And uh, an example of this is here this public Boolean set, which takes um, a string attribute name and then a value, which can be used as follows. So if set username 9cat, then do something. But what does this actually mean? From this code, we can tell. This can mean um, if the username is currently set to 9cat, it can mean, uh, well, we're setting the username to 9cat, and uh, the if only is true if this set was successful. Or it can only be true if uh, the username before was not 9cat and we actually changed it. So this is very unclear code if you do this. So 
Moving on, uh, it's good to minimize coupling in your system. Uh, if you're in a class or a function, you can look at the number of uh, classes you're binding to. So these can be uh, static calls, they can be uh, type hinting. Uh, they, if you're constructing a new instance of a class, you're also uh, making a binding to it. Uh, try to avoid inheritance. Inheritance is basically the strongest coupling you can have in your system. So if you're making a big Christmas tree of classes, everything deriving from a base class and, and so on, um, that's bad. Uh, try to avoid inheritance for code reuse altogether. Uh, basically the old OOP, OOP adage of uh, favor composition over inheritance. And this is particularly important when you're crossing some kind of uh, system boundary. So if you're using some kind of framework and it has classes that they want you to derive from, such as controllers or whatnot, you're creating a very strong binding to this framework if you put your business and application logic in these derivatives. And it will basically be impossible for you to switch to something else. So unless you want to build around the framework, and uh, live with it forever, you, you want to avoid that uh, a lot. And um, program against interfaces, so not concretions, and here interfaces means the concept of an interface. This does not need to be uh, the actual interface construct, constructs which you have in uh, Java or PHP. And that's uh, also uh, basically the dependency inversion principle. And Binding yourself to concretions because you think at some later point you're, um, well, because you're now using this concretion and you're thinking we will not be needing something else. So for instance, you're using a file system logger and you, you're not, you don't have any plans to change it. It's comparable to, well, having a lamp, putting it somewhere in your room and going, oh, I'm not planning on moving this lamp anytime soon. I'm just going to solder it into the wall. Uh, yeah, so this is something that's quite known. Global state is bad, but then what a lot of people don't realize is that static code is global. Um, so if you're making uh, static access to something and it uses any kind of state, this state can only come from a global source. Um, so singletons are not good. Um, and the Solution here is like the dependency injection buzzword, which is actually very simple. So suppose you have this function here, which has uh, some static access in it. So you have this file system logger here, which you have binding to. Um, and you have this data store here with some kind of singleton thingy. And um, yeah, so you're binding to the, the concrete implementations here. and uh, the database connection here and how it's initialized, this is all coming from global state. So this means when do stuff is called, this stuff will be executed. There is no way you can do something about this. So if you want to test some code that's calling do stuff, um, it's going to hit your file system and your database uh, without you being able to change this. Unless you go messing with global state, you might be able to do something, but yeah, so well, uh, the solution to this is quite simple. Just uh, inject your dependencies in your services so you, you have a logger and your data store thingy here and just call the things here uh, using polymorphism and then you can uh, mock out stuff in your tests. Which uh, reminded me of the Jackney principle. Uh, so basically you ain't going to need it. And this principle is about um, not being too preemptive in a certain kind of manner. Uh, so suppose you're working on some feature and you know this is related to another feature that your team is going to need half a year down the road. And you're thinking um, that you're probably going to need this first feature once you reach the second point. So you're already going to make it easier to do this by adding some additional capabilities into your system. Um, so this principle says to not do this because it entails a lot of cost. You have the, the cost of first creating your feature uh, that you don't need right away. You have the cost of delay, of delaying. So if you're working on this thing that you think you're going to need in the future, 
you're not doing something that you're needing right now, and there are always things you need right now which you probably should be working on instead. Then you have the cost of maintenance. As long as this additional capability is in your system, you need to maintain it. And then finally, once the day arrive that you actually need this additional capability, assuming it does, because in most cases you're wrong and it doesn't, um, then it's extremely likely that you didn't quite get it like the half month before. The requirement probably changed a tiny bit or you understand the problem better now. Or perhaps some part of your system changed that requires modification of what you did before to do it in a nice way. So then you still need to correct what you did in the beginning. So this all adds up and in a lot of cases the value you get out of this is zero because you're basically wrong in that we would need this additional capability. So important to remember with this is that this applies to features and capabilities and not to um, making your system easy to modify. Basically, the reason why we don't want to add these additional capabilities is because it makes it harder to modify our system. It increases the maintenance cost. But it doesn't mean we should stop doing the things that make it easier to maintain our system. So often you want to introduce an interface or you want to write a test even if your production code without this is going to run because it makes your system easier to maintain. How am I doing on time, by the way? Uh, Mine is so take your time. Okay. Press after you, it's going to wait. Mm -hmm. So uh, from this follows that simple design is uh, not simple. This is another common misconception. So it's basically easy to write a complex system. And yeah, th there is a saying that everybody can make a uh, computer understand the solution to a problem, uh, but it's a lot harder to make uh, humans understand it. So uh, I, I really like this quote, which has uh, not a lot to do with programming, but it uh, is about the same thing what I'm saying here, saying, I'm sorry I had to write you such a long letter, I didn't have the time to write a shorter one. So again, this is about um, that it's harder to write something concise. So um, and this is also important when you're thinking about technical solutions. I've come across the argument of, oh, you're, you're thinking about it so much, you must be building something that's complicated, but this is not true. You need to think about how you can build something simple. So if you just go ahead and do the thing that comes right off your mind, this is probably not going to be the most refined thing. Um, I'm... Yeah, so the solid principles is a um, set of uh, principles that I recommend you look into. These are mostly about uh, class level design, um, things about cohesion and coupling, uh, and yeah, there are, are funny things in here if you never thought about them in an abstract sense. For instance, uh, I have this presentation on the list of substitution principle in which I yeah, so it's, it's obvious that in the real world um, a square is a rectangle, but it turns out that this is actually a very bad idea to uh, implement a square as a subtype of a rectangle in uh, programming languages because they are not, um, yeah. Um, another thing to look into are design patterns. Um, well, I don't think I, oh yeah. So, I don't have a list of design patterns here. There are lots of design patterns, uh, and design patterns are basically reusable solutions to common problems. Um, so they start by, if you're, you, you have this problem of this form, then uh, you can probably uh, apply this kind of solution, which a lot of people used, and it's known to kind of solve this effectively, and you need to keep these things in mind. So uh, th there are plenty of books on design patterns that list these things and you can just look at Wikipedia to find the list. And um, a nice thing about this is that uh, you, you can also use it as a communication tool. So if you know what a strategy is or uh, an abstract factory, you can just communicate this with your colleagues and say, oh, um, I think you should not use the template method here but rather use a strategy. 
And you can also use this in the naming of your classes. And then uh, people that are not in your team at all can still kind of recognize what, what you're doing there, what the intent is. Um, then rounding up, um, I didn't have anything about like the, the more bigger architecture stuff. And there is this concept of uh, layering, um, which typically is presented as having a, really a bunch of layers on top of each other. Like at the top you have the presentation layer, then you have um, application, business, and uh, data access. And I, I like this representation more because it focuses more on uh, the most important aspect, I think, which is uh, the direction of the dependencies, which are these arrows here. So uh, the, the entities of your system basically depend on nothing. And um, uh, the, the things outside, they can depend on the things inside, right? So uh, the things that are in the outside, such as the UI and the database and uh, external services, they are not dependent on by anything else outside of their own specific uh, component, which means that your system is not bound to your uh, delivery mechanism. It's not bound to your data source. So if you want, if, if you have some kind of desktop application and you want to deliver it via the web, you can easily make this change without changing the entirety of your system. Or if you want to change your database schema or you want to change your database or you want to not have a database but talk to some kind of web service, you can all make these changes and they will not be groundbreaking changes. They will just be making a second implementation of your delivery mechanism or your data source. So you can also have multiple of these at the same time. Oh yeah, uh, also uh, I tried making this presentation in a form that it can act as notes so that you can look through it later. Um, and some of these things are linked. So for instance, the, the blue things are, uh, to the extent you can see this, are, are links. So final note is on tests, which I did mention at all so far, well, a little, but I had no dedicated slides on it. And basically I'm just going to say they are important, uh, otherwise you don't know how your system works. And I really believe that if you take the time to learn how to test well, um, and how to write tests effectively, you can write code that has tests faster than writing code without tests. So if I need to solve some problem fast that's not completely trivial, that's not five lines, I will write it with tests because it saves me all the debugging time and I know what I'm doing actually works. And it's, it's very nice to have the certainty that your system works and not be, oh, this might be doing something. And, Right, and uh, testable codes and good design really go hand in hand. If you have a big ball of mud, it's going to be very difficult to test it. And if you can test it, it doesn't mean your design is good, but it's at least an indication certain kinds of problems are not there. And if you have your tests, you can refactor. You don't need to be afraid of refactoring because if you break something, you, you will know you break it and then you can just fix it. And uh, to close the presentation, uh, I went over a lot of uh, like simple rules and saying, oh, this kind of thing is bad. Uh, but I think it's really important to avoid dogma. Uh, these things I'm talking about here are things that are true in most of the cases. And basically, I think our job is one of trade-offs. Uh, typically, it's simply not possible to um, satisfy all the relevant uh, principles because they tend to pull in different directions. And yeah, you, you basically need to figure out what the right trade-offs are and not try to, yeah. So, and it's important to understand what the principles behind the, the rules are. Um, so for instance, encapsulation is nice, but why is it nice? I think that's more important because this reason is because it helps us to reason about the code. That's what we're after ultimately. And if encapsulating something would contradict this value, so if it would make it harder to reason about some code, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. So try to transcend the rules, try to really understand what they are about, when to apply them. So if you're really new to um, programming, you can just uh, follow them and you will probably be doing something better than if you had no clue about any of this. 
But as you gain more experience, then find out where to not apply them and which trade-offs to make. So thank you for your time. We are.